Hello and welcome to Chandler Science, AP Physics 1, Describing Motion, Part 1. In today's lesson, we're going to look at what a motion diagram or motion map is. We'll see the differences between a vector quantity and a scalar quantity, and then we'll learn how to add, subtract, and multiply vector components. This is my very first video in my series of lectures designed to help you learn all there is to know about AP Physics 1 and pass that test in May. Because it is the very first video in this series, I'm going to keep it very simple and basic for now with the most fundamental things, and we'll work our way up to the harder stuff later, and I promise it will get harder. If you're one of my students, you're writing down your notes and three questions or clarifications to ask about later on in class. If you're from somewhere else on the internet, welcome, and I hope you enjoy. With that said, let's begin. Motion diagrams are simple and effective tools that allow us to analyze the motion of an object through space in one dimension. However, before I get to the motion diagram, let me say a quick word about the particle model in physics. The particle model allows physicists, that's you, to represent larger objects like airplanes, cars, and planets as simple dots or particles on your screen or paper. This is nice because it's a lot quicker and easier to draw a dot or a particle uh, than the entire car or airplane. The reason why we can do this is because despite the fact that these cars and airplanes and larger objects might have a lot of moving parts, the whole object itself moves as one continuous unit. So we can represent that object as a simple dot. And that's what we're gonna do on our motion diagrams. So let's do that now. A motion diagram is basically a long line with numbers along it that represent distance, usually in meters, although the units could be different. What we're gonna do is place a dot that represents our object at certain time intervals. Now in this example, we're gonna make a dot every one second. Okay, so where is the object every one second? What object? Well, let's make an object. So let's say we're going to play catch with our friend. We're going to throw a ball to our friend, and we're going to throw this ball at a certain speed. Our speed will be 2 meters per second. Now, you may or may not be familiar with this terminology, meters per second. It's just a speed, right? How fast the ball is moving. So you might not be familiar with that terminology, but I'm sure you're familiar with something like this. What about 80 miles per hour, MPH? Or if you're from out of the United States, you probably use kilometers per hour. Well, 80 miles per hour can also be written this way miles per hour, right? So what, that, what does that mean? If you were to travel at 80 miles per hour for exactly one hour, how far would you go? You'd go 80 miles, right? So this terminology is the same thing we're doing now, except instead of miles, we're using meters, and instead of hours, we're using seconds. So if we're going two meters per second, how far do we go in one second? Well, we go two meters, right? Because we're going two meters per every second. So if we throw the ball at two meters per second, where we draw the next dot in the next second. After one second, where's the ball? The ball is at two meters, right? So we put a dot there. One more second elapses. Now where's the ball? Now it's at four meters, right? Because it's going two more meters. You get the idea. And then one second later, it's at six meters. One second later, it's at eight. And then it's at 10. And then it's at 12. And that's a motion map. So the motion map shows the location of the object at certain time inter intervals. In this case, it was every one second, okay? I want you to notice one thing here, that when an object is going at a constant speed, the gaps between each dot are equally spaced apart, all right? But what if the object is not going at a constant speed? In this example, let's say we have a ball that's slowing down. Let's say you have a ball, and we're a soccer ball, and we're gonna kick it to our friend. So initially, we kick the ball to our friend at an average speed of five meters per second. One second later though, the gravel and dirt and all that crap slows the ball down, so now it's only going three meters per second. And then one second later, it slows down even more, and now it's only going one meter per second, and then the ball stops. So let's go ahead and place our first dot that represents the ball at the origin, because that's the easiest place to start. And then where's the next dot? Well, if the first second, the ball had an average speed of five meters per second, how far did it go? It went five meters, right? So place the dot here at five meter mark, but it slows down, the next one second elapses and the ball now only goes three meters. So put it down at eight because the ball slowed down its speed at this three meters per second. And then this last second, the ball has a speed of one meter per second. So in this last second, the ball is now at the nine meter mark because it slowed down a bunch and then it stops. So when an object are slowing down, I want you to notice that the gaps between the dots now start off big and then they shrink and get smaller as the object loses speed, all right? And then our last example, we're gonna speed up. So what happens then? In this example, let's say we have a ball that's speeding up. If we take a ball and place it on a ramp like this, and we let it go, the ball will slowly roll down the ramp and gain speed because of gravity, right? So let's go ahead and put a dot on the origin where we start. All right, one second later, where's the ball? Well, maybe the ball is at the one meter mark, right? One second later, where's the ball? Well, maybe now it's at the four meter mark. One second later, where's the ball? Maybe now it's at the nine meter mark. 
One other thing we can do with the motion diagrams is see how, what the speed is of the ball as time elapses. If you look at the gap between the first dot and second dot, it's one second elapses here. We know that. So what's the speed of the ball? Well, it must have been one meter per second. What's the speed of the ball on average between the second and third dot? Well, one to four meters. How far did it go? It went three meters. How long did it take? One second, right? So we know it's three meters per second. And then the last gap, four to nine, that's five meters, so it must be going five meters per second. So there's some things we can do with the motion diagrams. On this one, I want you to notice also that when the ball is speeding up, the gaps get bigger as the speed increases. Next, let's take a look at some different terminology. Let's compare vector quantities and scalar quantities. You've already gotten a little taste of one of the quantities that we measure in class, that being speed. We're going to measure a lot of different stuff in class, including speed, velocity, momentum, angular velocity, inertia, all kinds of stuff. And every one of these quantities will fall into one of two categories. It will either be a vector or a scalar quantity. However, before we discuss these two terms, we need to discuss one other term first. That term is magnitude. Magnitude is our fancy science word of saying how big something is, right? It's basically a number. If it's something that we can measure, it has a magnitude, right? So when you hear the word magnitude, I want you to think, oh, the number, how big is that thing? For example, if I asked you the magnitude of your bank account, you would tell me how much money was in your bank account, all right? Hopefully it's a positive number, not a negative number. You get the idea, right? So magnitude basically just means it's some number, right? All right, so let's go on to scalar and vectors then. A scalar quantity is a quantity that can be described with just one number, i.e. the magnitude, right? For example, your age. Age is scalar, all right? Students are often very surprised to find out that my age is, in fact, at the time of this recording, 36 years old, right? So what's the magnitude of my age? 36. Do I need any other description to tell you how old I am, right? I have the magnitude, 36, and the units that go along with it, years, right? That's it. That's all I need. So that's a scalar quantity. Some other stuff, like in physics land, it's scalar is like time. How Hey, how long has it been since the race started? Oh, you just missed it. It started 12 seconds ago. All right. Magnitude 12 units seconds. Hey, what is the mass of that object over there? Oh, the mass of that object is 15 kilograms. 15 is the magnitude, kilograms is the units. That's all you need, right? Boom. What about vectors though? Vectors are a little bit different. Vectors have magnitude, but they also have direction. And this is super, super important actually, right? I'm gonna give you one example of a vector from physics and that is velocity, all right? So if I told you, hey, or I asked you, how fast are you going? And you said you were going 25 meters per second. That's actually not a vector, is it? Because it doesn't have direction. You just told me how fast you're going, but you didn't tell me what direction you were going. What you told me was your speed. Speed is like velocity, but without direction. Speed is scalar. Velocity is a vector. It has speed, but then it has direction, right? It makes it special, so it's a vector. All right, so if you're gonna tell me how uh, fast you're going, 25 meters per second, and you wanna make it a, vector, a velocity vector, you gotta tell me, oh, well, maybe I'm going in this direction, or maybe that's east, right? Different ways to write it, but you get the idea. It has direction, and it has magnitude, all right? Now, let's talk about how we're gonna add, subtract, and multiply vectors together. So it turns out that vectors are really important in physics. We should get a handle on them now so we can use them all year long. Whenever we're doing problems that include vectors, it's often a good idea to draw them out so we can visualize them, which will help us solve the problem at hand. Let's do some quick examples now so you see what I mean. Let's say we have an object like a ball that's rolling on the ground to the right at five meters per second. Someone's gonna come along and give the ball a little nudge in the same direction, and they're gonna add some velocity to the ball. Maybe they're gonna add two meters per second to the ball. A quick note about vectors now. When we're drawing them out, we literally draw them as arrows to represent their magnitude, the length of the arrow. Notice that the five meter per second arrow is longer than the two, two meter per second arrow. And then of course they have the direction, the direction the arrow is pointing. All right, so whenever we're gonna add them, we always add arrows, what's called tail to tip. Always add them tail to tip, okay? So what's a tail and what's a tip? Well, this is the tail of one arrow, and here's the tip of the arrow. Okay. Now, it doesn't matter what order we do it in. We can take the tail of one arrow and add it to the tip of the other one, or vice versa. It doesn't make a difference. But the point is, as long as we take the tail of one arrow and put it on the tip of the other arrow, okay? So we're gonna redraw them now when we do that. So here's a five meter second arrow, I'm gonna take the tail of this guy, which is there, and put it on the tip of this arrow, which is there. But we're gonna redraw it, right? So it looks nice and neat. And there we go. So we've just combined those vectors. We've added them. We've added them tail to tip. 
Whenever we add or combine vectors in any way, we have to draw what's called the resultant vector. Resultant vector. The resultant vector is literally the result of adding two or more vectors together. In this case, it's pretty easy because it's just a simple straight line, right? We're always going to start at the very beginning. Where did we first start drawing this vector? We started right here, right? Where do we end? The last bit of arrow we drew was right here on the very tip, right? So the resultant vector will always be from the very beginning of the first arrow we drew to the very tip of the last arrow we drew, right there. What's the magnitude of this vector? Well, you probably guess that's seven, right? Because five plus two is seven. So our new magnitude of this new arrow will be seven meters per second. You'll notice that this arrow is longer than the five meter second arrow and the two meter second arrow, right? It's pretty easy when it's in a straight line. Let's try one that's not quite so easy. Let's say we have an example where we have a ball that's rolling along this direction at say eight meters per second. And someone's gonna come along and give it a kick or a push or a nudge in a different direction. They're gonna add five meters a second of velocity, but they're gonna add it in that direction, forward like that, okay, or to the north. Hmm, what happens now? Well, the same thing, the same pr procedure that we're gonna do, we're gonna take the tail of this arrow and put it on the tip of that arrow, right? So let's kind of rearrange them so they kind of line up. We have the eight meter second arrow this way, and we have the five meter second arrow this way. Hmm, it's not a straight line anymore, right? We still need to draw the resultant vector. We're gonna start with the very beginning of the first arrow we drew, which is right here on the X, and we're gonna go to that spot right there, right? The last little bit of the arrow we drew last. So we're gonna start here in the X and go to that circle. That arrow is a resultant vector. Now you might notice that if I have a horizontal line this way to the east and then one to the north like this, it makes a right angle. Hmm, kind of nice. What do we know about right angles? Well, hopefully you remember from geometry class, and it's pretty easy to find the hypotenuse if you know this side is eight, and this side is five. You can use Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. I've already done that for you. It turns out that the hypotenuse here is 9.4 meters per second. So this object will not be going eight or five or 13, but instead it'll be going 9.4 meters per second, the magnitude of our resultant vector, and we can even find the direction using some trigonometry. Remember your Sokotoa. I've already done the work for you as well. Turns out the angle is 32 degrees. You guys know this instinctively. If you push a ball in one direction like this, and then you push it again, but you push it up like this way, the ball is not going to suddenly turn and make a right, a right angle turn, right, and turn 90 degrees. It just doesn't do that. It's going to keep going kind of some, you know, diagonal direction, as you can see in the example, right? So that's what happens when we add vectors together. We're just going to take one tail, put it on the tip, and combine them, and then draw our resultant vector. Now let's take a look at how we subtract vectors. Subtract so vectors is actually the exact same procedure we just did with adding vectors with one little kink. We're gonna flip the negative vector. For example, let's say we have one vector. Let's say it's vector A. And let's say we have vector B also. It's a little bit shorter than vector A. Let's say we wanna subtract A minus B. A minus B equals, let's call the new vector C. So the resultant vector will be C, but what will it look like? Well, if A is this way, and then B was also that way, but now you see B is negative, right? Because we've put a negative sign in front of the B. Whenever you have a negative sign in front of the vector, you just flip its direction. So if B was to the right, negative B will be the same magnitude, but to the left, opposite direction. So now B is this way. And then we're gonna combine the vectors the same way we did before. One tail to the other's tip. Doesn't matter what order we do it in, so long as we have one tail going to the tip, we're good, right? So we have here, the vector A, and then I'm gonna take uh, the tail here actually and put it on the tip of that guy. So it's actually gonna go back this way, something like that, okay? This is kind of weird. We have two vectors kind of overlapping each other. So what does the resultant vector look like? Well, it's still gonna go uh, start from the very beginning of the first vector we drew, the X, to the tip of the last arrow that we drew, which is right here, right? So it turns out that a resultant vector, let's get different colors so that we can see it, let's go blue, will be right here. If I redraw it separately so it looks, we can see it easier, it's right there, right? And the length of this arrow will be C. It'll be whatever A minus B was, right? Let's do it again, but using different directions. So let's get my red pin again. 
All right, so we have, this time we're gonna have vectors D and vectors E. And I wanna do E, uh, so D minus E equals F. So the we're gonna label the resultant vector F, there's D and there's E. So notice there's no negative sign in front of the D. That means D must be positive. So we're gonna leave D alone, right? But there's a negative sign in front of the E. That means we're gonna flip E around, right? So E was pointing down to the left. So negative E is in the opposite direction. You can just kind of think of taking the arrow head and putting it on the other end of the arrow. So instead of going down left like that, it goes kind of upright like this. This is negative E. So when we combine these two vectors, we're gonna have D going to the right like that, and then we're gonna take E, the negative E, the tail of it, I'm gonna put it on the tip here. So I'm gonna draw like that. So it turns out F will be from the very beginning, right there, to the very end, right there, and our resultant vector will be, and we'll do it in a different color so it can make more sense. The resultant vector will be from the very beginning, to the very end, and there is our F vector, all right? So that's how you subtract vectors. You simply flip around the direction. You don't change the magnitude or anything else. You just flip it around so it's the opposite direction that it was facing, all right? Now let's go to multiplying vectors. When we subtracted vectors before, we changed the direction of the arrows, but we let the magnitudes alone. Well, when we multiply vectors, we're gonna leave the direction alone, but we will change the magnitude. Let's take a look and see how that works. Let's say we have two vectors, vectors A and vectors B. And then let's say we do a problem. One half A plus two B. Well, there's a negative sign in there, so we're gonna leave the direction of the arrows alone, but we have these coefficients in front of the vectors. The coefficients tell us how much to change the magnitude by. One half means that A should be half as long. Recall that we said the length of the arrow corresponds to the magnitude of the vector. Well, if this is one A, then half A should be half as long, right? So there's half A. If this is one B, then two B should be twice as long, right? So there's two B. And you try to draw straight arrows as best you can, but oh well, that's good enough for us. All right, so there's one half A, half as long as A, and two B, twice as long as B. All right, now when we combine these vectors, we're gonna add them the same way we've been doing. We'll take the tail of one and put it on the tip of the other one, right? So we're gonna redraw these to make it nice and neat, one half A, and then the tail of two B on here, and there's two B. And then we're gonna draw our resultant vector. Never forget to draw your resultant vector. From the very beginning, where we started here, to the tip of the last arrow we drew. I'm drawing these X's and circles, by the way, just to kind of illustrate how, you know, where to draw the arrows from. You wouldn't actually put the X and circle on there if you, you know, when you were doing this in class or on a test or something, right? All right, so that's our resultant vector in blue from the very beginning to the final tip, right? Let's do one more problem, just kind of hammer this home. In the last example, let's combine everything we've learned. Let's include multiplication and the, multipli and the subtraction. Let's do 2A minus 1 half B all right, so this time we're gonna take the A vector and make it twice as long, so that's one A, and two A should be about twice as long as that, so maybe like that long, and then negative one half B. All right, so there's B, is B is down, which means that negative B should be up. There's also one half B, so it's a different direction and half as long, right? So maybe like this, this is negative one half B. And guys, you'll notice I'm not like trying to be exactly precise with the length of these arrows. It's really more about, you know, getting close enough so that you get the idea. No one's gonna get a ruler out and measure these things, okay? You just wanna make it, make it clear that you know what you're doing, all right? So it's negative one half B up, so we're gonna have two A here, and then negative one half B, the tail of the tip, about like that. And then we're gonna draw from the very beginning of this guy to the very last tip of the last arrow we drew. So our resultant vector will be there in blue, and there we have it. So we learned how to add, subtract, and multiply vectors. All right, guys, that's it for this video. Hope you learned something, hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below if you have any questions at all. My students, mention me on our mind or email me anytime. Remember guys, I have no life, you are my life, so never hesitate to ask any questions at all. Hope you learned something, have a great day, thank you.